Welcome to the Saving Science Show. And today, this time around, we're lucky to have uh, Dr. Lee Jessam, who's a social psychologist and distinguished professor at Rutgers University. And he specializes in uh, stereotype accuracy and ideological political biases, which are very timely for the broader society, but also very timely for understanding the behaviors and misbehaviors of sci scientists themselves. And, and so uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. Um, and so just a brief outline, I was thinking things we can maybe hit, but we want this to be very organic and, and, let, and we'll go to where we need to go. Uh, so cool. just what's happening with you, your recent work, uh, maybe recent flame wars you've been in, uh, and then talk about scholarship, <laughs> uh, scholarship suppression, uh, and then uh, the lack of political ideological diversity and how we can try to ensure there's sufficient ideological political uh, diversity in universities, and then really uh, the broader negative harmful effects of woke culture uh, on society and science. And then finally, really try to talk about concrete actions. Like I really want to try to zone yeah. in on concrete actions yeah. we, we can take now to, uh, in a sense, de-wokeify uh, universities, de-wokeify journals, de-wokeify journal uh, funding agencies, and broader academia. So, uh, go ahead. Uh, how about I have no answers to any of that? Thank you. This has been a wonderful interview. <laughs> yeah, well, I like tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know. I, I really probably don't have good real-world answers to any of that. Like, you started by asking what I'm up to. But the, the, one of the coolest things that I have gotten involved with in the last four or five months is there is a small research center at Princeton called the Network Contagion Research Institute. And then mainly, you know, big data, social media, text analysis type guys, you know, sort of hairy computer guys. But they put together kind of an amazing team uh, that includes like a former New Jersey Republican state attorney general right. and like the big wig for police intelligence in the New York City mayor's office, you know, like from 10 years ago or something like that. Um, and this group has been studying radicalization, like serious radicals, like, you know, like extremist violence kind of radicalization. And before they brought me on, they had this influential report um, sort of the rise of right-wing extremist groups, how they use social media to sort of organize, gain recruits, and then perpetrate essentially acts of terrorism. Right. Uh, and that made a big splash. Of course, that's so something that the you know the most way now, and I think it's much worse than it used to be. Left-wing media wants to hear. It's the kind of thing that academics want to hear, you know, the evil right-wing extremists. And they are evil, and, they, they, you know, it was a good report, and they deserve to have a lot of flesh. But they brought me on board when they started working on left-wing extremism. Right. And it was, you know, in spirit, it was similar and symmetrical in that what they were investigating were, was the rise of like seriously dangerous left-wing extremist groups. So, for example, just there's lots of examples like this. But one, I mean, I, which I didn't know until I started working with these guys, there's the Socialist Rifle Association, which is a radical left version of the NRA. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they're not as big as the NRA, uh, NRA but they have like uh, 30 or 40,000 members. So they're not like some, I mean, they're a fringe group, but they're not tiny. They're not like 300 net cases in Idaho or something. Right. It's like 40,000 people. So, so um, that, that's only one example. And there are all these groups that they, and we ended up thinking of them as sort of anarchos, anarchic socialist groups. They're not always socialist, but, uh, and this group was working on this stuff before sort of the endless violence. I mean, they're not really riots. I, because they're really, like I think of a riot as kind of spontaneous violence. You know, you have some demonstration and things begin to get out of hand and then, you know, 
the, the cops get too aggressive and somebody attacks the cops. And the next thing you know, stores, windows are being broken and stuff is being looted. Like, that's a riot. It's not really planned. These groups have planned attacks on the police um, in, in places like Seattle and Portland. So the effort was symmetrical in that the question was similar, sort of what's going on with these, you know, these sort of left-wing extremist groups. Right. Their, what's going on is not exact, it's not completely symmetrical with the right-wing extremist group. So they haven't been around quite as long in general. Um, and so they're not quite as large or quite as powerful. And they haven't, you know, these right-wing extremist groups have engaged in low-level acts of terror and murder for years. I mean, you know, the number of people killed by right-wing extremists, you know, going back 20 years is in the hundreds. Which, you know, there's 300 million Americans, like, the murder levels are much higher than that. Right. How terrible is that? You know, and you can have a discussion about that. My only point is that the, the number of deaths laid at the hand of left-wing extremists is much lower than that. And it's probably in single digits. Um, uh, but there are also a newer phenomena, and they absolutely have coordinated political violence, the, the political, much of the political violence in Portland, Seattle, and in some other places. And so, and, and much like the right wing extremist groups, they're heavily involved in social media. You know, they use news as basically recruiting propaganda also as incitement propaganda. So I don't know whether, you know the ACAB meme? No. AC, ACAB is all cops are bastards. Oh, oh blasphemous. Okay. There's also ACAB, all yeah. cops are bad. Um, yeah, yeah, no, like all cops are bad. Well, it could be bad, but it's, you know, all cops are bastards. Basically. And they have all these like memes and, uh, you know, and, and it's designed to capture and inspire basically I mean, hatred and demonization don't really quite capture it. It's re I mean, it certainly is designed to inspire hatred and demonization, but with a goal of gaining recruits to participate in, as far as what I can tell, essentially the violent overthrow of the U.S. government. I mean, I think that's what they're in the business for. And they don't really have, what makes them anarchic is they don't really have an alternative. But are these I mean, people on like, campus? Are these uh, groups on campus? This report did not identify. So I would, that's an interesting question. This report, so, so we've posted this report. It was more like a white paper than a publication. And a ton of the media picked it up. And amazingly, I mean, we really worked hard at not overstating the case. You know, we, we really wanted to nip in the bud pushback of the sort that we were making too much of the data and all this sort of stuff. And a lot of places, I mean, I, 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 um, sort of very even-handed places like the Hill, um, there was a reasonably good article in the Washington Post and really good ones actually in the New York Times on it that did justice to it. So we felt really good about it. We are, so that report, to answer your question, did not go into academia. To our students or faculty. However, um, we're actually meeting later this afternoon to talk about next steps, and we've had some preliminary discussions. And one of the reasons they brought me on board was to address the problem of intellectual justification for radical extremist violence emerging from academia. Wow. So you don't have too many academia, academics like, you know, bashing store windows or, you know, shooting fireworks at police. So they're not actually engaging in that, the kind of violence you see in Portland. But the, essentially the, the, the sort of vilifying propaganda directed at everything from mainstream institutions to United U.S. cultural history to the people who push back on them is it strikes me as extreme and, and serves or, or at least plausibly can be viewed as serving as a form of ideological indoctrination that raises the risk of sort of active radicalization among other people. To some extent, independent of them, I have this trilogy of papers. You referred to one, the one on suppression, 
um, that either have recently come out or will come out soon enough. And the first is basically a review and sort of theoretical model of the problem of political biases in academia. Okay, and I think of that as almost the base of the pyramid. So when you have, so this is in, in the radicalization literature, which was developed primarily originally to explain Islamic terrorism, there is this model, which is sort of a, like a thought model. It's not like a causal model or a structural equation model. I mean, it's a pyramid. And the <laughs> idea is at the base, you have like average everyday people who, you know, sort of don't want to get involved, but they're not going to fight, or, right? And then just above the base, you have people generally sympathetic or supportive of kind of radical goals. Just above that base of people generally supportive, you have sort of the intellectual vanguard. People providing the ideology, the rhetoric, the, rhetoric, the propaganda, the memes, the, the scholarly papers, uh, and basically explaining why radical, revolutionary, if necessary, violent means are necessary to overturn this horribly unjust system, whatever the target system might be. Now, those people are not usually personally engaging in revolution or terrorism, but they are provided, they are absolutely providing the intellectual justification for it. And then at the peak of the pyramid, you have people actually engaging in these fights, these acts of, of violence and, and extremism. Okay, so with that as the general backdrop, I, I, we didn't write these papers with this in mind exactly, but it has sort of, I think it captures it, this pyramid metaphor captures it. So, the, when, when the social, the social sciences and humanities are overwhelmingly people on the left. And it's not just like people on the left. These are not like, I mean, some are, but it's not like a, a typical distribution of like Biden Democrats or, you know, social Democrats in Germany. Something like 40 or 50% identify as Marxist or radical. Right. <laughs> Not normal left. This is not, you know, conventional left wing politics that's in the academia. These are self described radicals and extremists. In some, you know, it's going to vary from survey to survey and from field to field, even. But the, even if it was, even if it did represent the um, existing distribution of sort of left of center politics in America, because the academy is all little, I mean, it just sounds like, you know, a delusion of Fox News, but it's like literally true. There are almost no people on the, there's not, I was going to say on the right, there's almost no people to the right of the left. There's almost no moderates. No, right, like classical you know, liberals, of, right? Right. Classical there's, there's liberals very few classical liberals. Out. That's right. Uh, yeah. Right. There's very, very few, few people like that. So, so even if it was drawn from a represent, even if academia was drawn from a representative sample of the left, you're going to have twice as many radicals here because there is no one on the right. And, and that's if it was representative, which it definitely is not. Okay, so that's the, now that's not inherently a problem. I mean, if somebody's a Marxist studying the frequency of black holes in other galaxies, I mean, that's not, not really going to matter. They can just do their Marxism separate from their astronomy. I mean, it's just not really going to matter. But the problem is, in the social sciences and humanities, tons of what we deal with are unpoliticized topics. So it still is not inherently a problem if you could be confident that the, we're all trained so exquisitely well that we have methods that we can rely on <laughs> to absolutely ensure that our biases are not inflicted on our data, our studies, and our conclusions. But that's a ridiculous claim. As you know, I mean, you know from all the dysfunctions in psychology, our methods, you know, maybe they're beginning to get better, have been very, very weak. And so that means data has been, to a large extent, sort of a blank canvas on which faculty can paint their biases. And that's when the data, in the, in the humanities, you don't even need data. You just need to make an argument. Right, so it's even worse. But I'd say, actually, in terms of um, if our methods were much stronger and we had much stronger, even minimum transparency standards, of course, these political biases would uh, matter less and, and have less of an effect, but they would still be something we want to kind of 
keep an eye out because as you know, it depends on your position or your philosophy of science. But it, but, but generally when you discover something, it's very nebulous. And so like the discovery of oxygen, like you're actually always kind of going off of, you're interpreting the data and trying right. to move forward. So, so, so unless you're, you're like a, a realist, uh, you're, you're always kind of trying to interpret the data and conjecture uh, right. with, and those can be affected by your invisible ideological biases, right? Because, um, and, and, and even in open science, this is what I'm realizing, the open science movement itself is, has been corrupted invisibly by these ideological right. forces that most of the majority, they don't even see. It's like the water they're swimming right. in. And, and so when, when I'm trying to make things of, of uh, make sense of things and, and I make these claims, like it really shocks people uh, that, that I'm thinking this stuff, but that's because I've been outside the system for long enough, though I still have some you know, deconditioning to do. I have some residual <laughs> wokeness in me that I'm shedding, trying to shed, but it takes a while to kind of uncondition yeah. yourself. <laughs> uh, well, that's exactly right. So, the, um, as you know, much of the effort in the science reform movement has been on transparency, methods, and statistics. And that's fine. And that's fine. That was all necessary and useful and constructive, and we needed that. But exactly as you were arguing, there is no method that I know of, no method, no statistic to ensure either objectivity or validity of an interpretation. Interpretations are inherently subjective. And so in our paper presenting this model of political bias, there are very few, were there, were there any, I don't think we argued that anything statistical was involved in the manifestation of, of biases. You have interpretation, you have the questions that people ask, you have which literature they cite. Um, uh, so you have, and one of my favorites is, is selective calls for rigor. So let's say you do some PC study and, you know, someone else does some anti-PC study. And, and PC, so, you know, world can be consistent with, you know, a, with the importance of oppression, with discrimination causing gaps, right? And that's a PC, you know, do some study. Yes, discrimination is real, it's important, and it's accounted for a large part of the income gap between blacks and whites. Let's say some, someone did that. Well, wow, that's PC. That may be true. It may be a completely valid study, but it sort of validates these PC narratives. Okay, fine. If someone else comes along and uses essentially your method and reach and you know a, a uses data, gets a somewhat different kind of data, assesses a few other variables, and concludes, no, actually. Most of the racial gap doesn't come from discrimination. It comes from something else. And the risk, that what is likely to happen is because of the sort of extreme activist form of leftism in academia, the paper arguing that no discrimination is not very important is likely to be subject to intense scrutiny that is never applied to the paper using really identical methods that found that discrimination is important. And it's even so worse. True, yeah. I'll but get right. back to it. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, but that, and that's, that's a manifestation of political bias. And I, I have, in my experience, my discussion with social psychologists about this is maddening because they try and make the discussion about the validity of the criticism of the anti-PC paper. And it's like, okay, we could have that discussion. But if, if you, literally, not you personally, but whoever I'm having this argument with, never apply those standards when the results validate your preferred conclusions, 
I don't really, I mean, in some sense, it's important to know what's actually true, but with respect to this discussion in which we are evaluating the extent to which political biases infect the field, I really don't care whether that's, a, that's right or not. But what's relevant is that no one is applying it on the sort of PC validating narrative. That is the manifestation of political bias. And as I can't, well, but what's really important is that we need to know what's true. And so, you know, if this study is not true, we need to know it. Because I can't, I, like, how, I don't know how to break into that. I, I, I don't know how to have a discussion with somebody who keeps, this feels like sixth grade. Right. Where, yeah. Like somebody struggling to stick to some argument. Yeah, it feels like it's, they're not even arguing in, in good faith. Right. Uh, but speaking yeah. of selective rigor, have you heard this case? Well, you probably did. At, at, so PN, P, P, PNAS, uh, it's a Cesare, Joe Cesario, uh, and Johnson yeah. paper, which was retracted by, uh, well, they claim, so the, the authors retracted it, uh, but it's a complicated story. I'm covering it in another video, yeah. but so that's even worse. I mean, it's selective rigor, but it's almost like, a, it's, well, it's kind of a politically motivated retraction. And then Cesario actually has evidence um, that they've published another paper uh, on a very similar topic that has actual major flaws and is not being called for retraction. Uh, and so he's writing a commentary to, to, the, to identify this. He's actually compiling kind of a comparison of how they managed to pressure them to retract their article, even though they, there are like, it's been scrutinized like the most uh, than like almost any yeah. paper I've seen. They have public data, they have open data, they have higher transparency, right. and they find some, you know, kind of like very minor things. And so actually, they're even breaking kind of the ethical, there's ethics for what stand, what requirements need to be met to retract a paper. Right. And it's not right. even close to meeting that standard because it has to be a major error uh, that actually right. changes conclusions, um, experimental error uh, or problems with the data. There's none of that. The authors stand 100% beside their, behind their work. And yet they manage right. to retract a paper, right? But then, of course, if the evidence you know, supports or consistent with the narrative of anti-black police brutality, then all of a sudden things are getting accepted with actual major flaws, right? Uh, and that to me is yeah. almost like the beginning or the death, like the beginning, the early death of science when you have not just the researchers yeah. homogeneously left-leaning, but then even like the journals, which of course the editors are just an, a branch of academia, uh, are now retracting papers uh, due to political pressure. Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. So th this is, I sort of got distracted there. So I have this trilogy that starts with this uh, uh, political bias paper. But, and then the next one that ratchets it up is on research suppression. Um, and this is, uh, what, you're, what you're just describing is an example of that. Um, and, you know, one of the points we make in the suppression paper is that there, over the last few years, this is a new phenomenon. Maybe not brand new, but it's really was almost unheard of until a couple of years ago. You have basically academic outrage mobs calling for a paper to be retracted. And I, I haven't tallied it. I'd say about half the time they're successful, roughly. And half the time they're not successful. The, the inflection point, the key thing there is not the mob. It's, it's the authorities. It's the editors or the journal publisher, right? Whether it's a mob calling for somebody to be fired or a paper to be retracted, the power to do so is, you know, is not really with the mob. It's with the deans and the provost or the journal editor. And so the core problem in cases like that is sort of the spinelessness of the editors. Now, the Cesario thing is a little different because if I remember that correctly, like I didn't know the second part where there's this other paper with even more flaws and you know, nobody's up in arms about that. That's completely consistent with this selective call for rigor business, but I, I don't know that part of it. The first part, as I understand it, they were under a lot of pressure. They were under heavy criticism and they opted to retract it. So they didn't retract it. It wasn't like the editor forcibly retracted it. Now, maybe the editor was... No, but he shared the email exchange and it's uh, the email evidence is, is pretty compelling. 
that, the, that right? they were going on and on. You know, the criticisms they called in these other guest uh, peer reviewers, and they were relentless. And like it basically, they felt like they were going to retract it anyway, but they just wanted the authors to retract it because it makes them oh. look, you know, less <laughs> uh, kind of embarrassing. But yeah. And I didn't know that part of the story. I should get, you know, I've been in touch with them on and off, and I haven't been in touch with them in a few months. So, so, yeah, but what can we do? So, uh, going back to maybe, um, <laughs> well, the journals or the the researchers, right? Um, because on the one hand, uh, we want true diversity. So, diversity again being kind of this weird code word, but but so we want to ensure political, intellectual, ideological diversity. But how do you ensure that without resorting back to these uh, dangerous group-based quotas right? and, and affirmative action? Right. So how, right. how can we, you know what I mean? Because uh, I'm against, yeah, yeah. like I would be against saying, okay, yeah, now we're yeah. going to only hire conservative professors for five years. Right? Yeah, yeah. I would be against yeah, that. Yeah. But how else, yeah, right. how else are we going to actually increase right. diversity uh, right. the most so, important so time? That's, right. That's really the right question. And no one really has an answer no, because nobody's actually done it right and i don't believe anybody has the answer to that until they've actually pulled it off and then we would have to say okay well that they did this and this is what works but but one way, thing to keep in mind is that the sort of radicalization the sort of rise of you know, for lack of a better word, wokishness, intersectionality, critical race theory, as like gospel truth, not like as ideas to be discussed or debated. Like, you know, if you go against this, you're you're worse than a climate science denier because it means you're a racist as well. Right. Um, right. So, I mean, if you're a climate science denier, you're just an ignorant axe grinder. But if you're an intersectionality denier, you know, then you're, you know, in addition to being, you know, an, 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 an ignorant, an ignorant truth denier, I don't know if they call it an ignorant truth denier, on top of that, you're an evil bigot. So it's even worse. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's even and there's way less, I mean, most of these ideas have some grains of truth underneath them. So they're not like completely wrong. I, you know, I mean, the, the United slavery was embedded in the United States from its founding. That is true. Yeah. That doesn't mean the entire country was built on slavery. Like, those are two very different claims. Right? But there's some truth to the embedding of slavery, right? And the, the you know, the, the founders seriously compromised their uh, otherwise espoused principles in order to permit slavery to be, and that's clearly true. Um, there's a long, long evil history, especially in the South, but not only in the South. Of institutionalizing those practices. So, you know, the white supremacy story, there is some truth underlying it. Uh, but, but having said uh, that, the approach, and it, in a non conspiratorial way, and I don't think there was some like master critical race theorist directing people behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just like nothing like that happening. But, but you can nonetheless look at how that rise has happened. And how that has happened was through essentially um, sort of the slow um, embedding of this ideology in most, uh, initially mostly humanities uh, uh, programs and departments and spreading out from there also into the various studies, ethnic studies, women's studies. Um, and so now it's institutionally embedded. And then, and then, you know, it sort of infected education schools. And then these people are trained to become educators and administrators. And now you have administrative offices essentially devoted to wokeness. Yeah. That's what you have. So they're now embedded, right? So, so, but that's actually really, so, so then that means it's going to be very difficult to fight, right? Because they kind of, in a sort of right wing like nightmare, they have captured not the Senate and the House and the presidency or even the governor's office. What they've captured are these intermediate level institutions like colleges and universities and, you know, and public school systems and, oh, and, exactly. and, and corporate uh, and high tech right, and uh, right, even right, Hollywood. That's right. So it's like the tentacles have spread in every aspect 
uh, of society right. and culture. And then pol politics is downstream right. from culture, right? Right. Uh, and that's right. why I feel like it's it's kind of our responsibility. Like if it really came from academia and spread everywhere and spread like a virus, it's it's like an ideological virus yeah. would actually potentially be a lot more dangerous <laughs> than other viruses. Um, as you say, it's going to be really difficult to de um, the because there's so many different tentacles uh, everywhere and, and they have different uh, jurisdictions, different ways to kind of clean things up. Um, but at your university right, specifically, yeah, right. um, like you're a chair, so you're in a sp special position. Uh, like, uh, have you done anything to de your department? <laughs> uh, well, so the like I can think of hiring, promotion, um, yeah, student clubs. The that's a very difficult question, in part because I would really prefer to stay as non political as possible. So that makes it very, very difficult. Um, and I live here. So if the dean say I or my department have to go to some diversity training, it's insubordinate for me not to go. So, and they actually haven't had us do that. But the Office of Employment Equity did actually just come to the department to give a training on harassment and discrimination. Now, there are bona fide legal issues there, and like we need to know what those are. So I didn't resist or argue or anything like that when that happened. And I would not say that training was particularly woke. It was just, you know, it was like these are the rules and laws, and, you know, some govern what you have to do if something happens, and you need to know what you need to do. And, all that stuff. So there's that. Um, on the other hand, after Floyd's murder, um, I made the mistake, and I really do regret having done this, of sending an email to my department basically saying, really, you know, there's, there's sort of nastiness all around. There's propaganda all around. People are exploiting this. And academia is at its best when it approaches these things thoughtfully and, you know, sort of prudently. And I was denounced as a racist for that. The main reason I regret sending it is I really should not have stepped into a political, you know, firestorm. That, that was really, you know, I shouldn't have done it. Now, those, now I don't know how much you know, because so what, what is your what is your position now? What are you doing? Well, I'm a science watchdog, so I'm kind of in between uh, positions or yeah, in between yeah. funding. So I was uh, in Belgium on a two year Marie Curie grant, uh, but uh, to fight, I mean, like I've been in and out of the system, and that's kind of a unique position. So, right. I mean, right. it's not sustainable, but I'm trying, and this is why I'm trying to uh, focus on the most important aspects, and even tell, like, I'm starting to reach out to politicians. And journalists and basically tell them like I, I'm working pro bono to actually change standards at, in academia to change right. uh, laws with respect to open access and the time window is limited right because being a whistleblower right. is already very difficult um, right es especially when you have very limited time and resources um, but yeah I mean I'm not uh, it's just right now I mean there's there's I'm in Ottawa and and um, there. There could be positions, but like I wouldn't really be able to do what I what I want to do, and it speaks directly to scholarship uh, suppression because, uh, like they don't really want my kind. <laughs> and then, like, do I really feel comfortable, uh, like even talking about like, and even at Western, uh, often I would meet colleagues, and we like we'd have to go off campus to have discussion, right? right. Because like it's like you're you're you're. You're whispering, you're looking over your shoulder, like right. you know it's just like this is so but um so so I can sympathize with because you're right i mean we we kind of want to depoliticize academia 
uh, in a sense. I mean, so of course, um, when you're going to be studying political biases and politics is everywhere, but there should be kind of a, a culture of, well, our job, our main job is scientists, right? And of course, we, we can talk about politics. Politics affects science, right? But again, I think it goes back to this neo-Marxism where what's the expression of the personal is political, which I think is, is, is pretty misguided. And why do I need to know about your sexual orientation, right? I mean, like, so I'm open-minded. I don't want to talk about any dark, twisted humor, uh, but your sexual orientation, you know, that's pretty personal. So like, why are you bringing it up? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, the reason why I asked actually was it was after the Floyd murder and the so, subsequent protest. Um, I, I don't, and I don't think I kept these. But as chair, there's this like chairs lister, and everyone and their whole family were sending these hyper woke re commitments to do better, to, you know, to fight systemic racism and, you know, root out white supremacy from our university. Universities are like the least white supremacy right. place on earth. So, you know, right? so, so, and I wish I'd cut them. I, I, I might, I was I'm looking over to the facts yeah. to see if I had any, but, but it was just one after another. And of course, none of those people got to know, uh, you know, for being un unduly political or anything like that. So, um, and it's bad. I mean, I, the no, I, I'm not going to tell you story because I was held to confidence that I, 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 because of who I am, because of my public presence, uh, people come to me with a horror story, and I, I have heard just buckets full of horror stories of experiences right. on there. So how about and the people? The people are tired into silence. I mean, you know, the the environment is so toxic. People are not going to say anything, even in the face of extreme intolerance. Yeah, no, I call it closet conservatism, <laughs> uh, where like in grad school at, at Western um, in Canada, which is uh, and it's actually funny because London is a city uh, in southern Ontario. Uh, for those who don't know much about Canada, like it, Western is, is uh, like London, Ontario is actually pretty conservative fiscally, a lot of insurance company, a lot of private banks. Uh, but Western University is, is very left um, leaning. And so, yeah, we had like we didn't even know until later that we had conserv we had a few conservative professors, but they would never speak up. Right. It was like you would have to have conversations off campus. Uh, and um, and that that cannot be uh, healthy. And again, it's just very sad that like again, university should be the last place where you feel uncomfortable speaking your mind, especially when maybe your ideas right. are better than the other ideas. Right? I mean, but so it's just a fundamentally broken uh, system that deviates yeah. uh, from really the basic, uh, even beyond like earlier than, than J. S. Mill uh, and. Uh, you know, individual liberty, but but more than that, like the active, and this is maybe where we're going in terms of more concrete actions and your work at the Heterodox Academy, where um, I think they've done good work, but I think they, they need to go further uh, and might be a bit too too soft. But again, they they do deserve a lot of credit. Uh, and because, and this may be another question about concrete actions where we, we learn to be better civilized debaters and and learn how to disagree respectfully and how to have debates with our intellectual enemies and still be able to be respectful, right? I think that's something we really lost, like how to debate people we disagree with, uh, especially when it's emotional issues like anti-black uh, police brutality or abortion, right? Like it's it's a skill, it's a difficult skill, but like we're not even... Close, it seems like, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what I actually think about that because you you can't you. I'm not sure there's anything you can do. Well, but you need to start much earlier than college. 
in order to encourage a culture of discussion and exchange of ideas, even with people who hold ideas that you find abrasive or offensive. Because, but surely by the time they get into academia or even graduate school, but probably even college, when people are, people don't want to debate. They want to denounce their enemy. You can't have a discussion with such a person. Right. What you need to do is form a protective circle of people who reject that entire way of being so that those who want to have a free discussion that maybe includes ideas that someone else would consider offensive or repulsive or psychotic, but don't, when the rest of us can have that discussion without fear, without no really, most, uh, and that's, maybe that's too strong. Being denounced is a less severe problem than being fired or not getting a job, right? I mean, it's bad. You know, it's very unpleasant. It's very uncomfortable. Um, Michael Inzik, uh has a great, he and Joe Inbar have this four beers podcast, and he has this great riff somewhere in one of them. I think it was on the IDW, the Intellectual Dark Web, on how he says, I'm a tenured professor. I'm a full, I'm paraphrasing. I'm a tenured professor. I'm, I'm a full professor. You know, mobs could denounce me. Like nothing really could happen to me, but it would be so unpleasant. It would be so stressful. Like I don't think I would want to deal with it. I would be afraid of having to deal with it. So why, why you know, so I'm not going to go out on the limb and say something controversial that I think might actually be true and worth having a discussion about because the risk of getting that kind of hostile pushback is just something I don't want to deal with. Yeah. So that's, that's just, yes. Yeah. And it's way worse if you can't get a job or if you get fired from a job. Right. And again, it's, it's reasonable. But again, if no one stands up, if no one stands up uh, or not enough people stand up, then the system never changes. And then right. it's almost like a tragedy of the commons, right? Um where the silent majority uh, basically yes. is squashed, right? Because I, right. I, I mean, I, I truly believe that most humans are, are inherently good people. Yeah. Uh, but when you're in a bad system uh, and you're acting it's selfishly, bad. and I think yeah. people are justified in acting selfishly, and people say, "Well, I have a house, I have a family." Yeah, but but if if no one, if the silent majority doesn't speak up, then uh, it's right. uh, it's a game over. And that's why people like the Australian uh, geophysicist Peter Ridd, I mean, these people really need to be celebrated because you know, they risked it all to actually say, right. no, I think the emperor doesn't have any clothes and I'm willing okay. to lose my job and spend $1.7 million in legal fees to get my job back. And now he's supported by his wife's uh, retirement fund. Uh, yeah. You know, but uh, so we need more of these courageous people um and uh but but and i agree it, that uh, going back to education that the it needs to start much early and so the, the whole education system the public one well probably even private needs to be dewokeified and this is why i was uh, you probably heard of this executive order uh that came in pretty late uh by the trump administration and and I don't want to focus on the politics, but uh, like, and I'm definitely not a Trump supporter, <laughs> but I, I I like to give credit where credit is due, right? And, and so you can you you should be able to say, as an intellectually mature person, you should be able to say, I disagree with Donald Trump on 98 percent of right. things, but on this specific right. issue, the executive order yeah. combating sex and race stereotyping in the workforce. Or in the government, uh, any like to me, he was right, right on that, and yeah. uh, and that applied to any federal agency or any contractor, and I think right. they also had plans to do it for education uh, because it's public education is kind of part of the government. So I'm trying to s start something like that in Canada, uh, where we move this through legislation. Uh, to, but as but as they they faced a lot of pushback and I mean it's written it's it's, it's a tricky thing because it's uh you want to like not all diversity uh, trainings are bad like they had to distinguish right. between 
Like you cannot use divisive language like white right. guilt, right. white shame, right. white privilege. But right. it is a blurry line between right. dewokifying and then infringing on freedom of speech, which of course they support. Right. Uh, right. But we need yeah, yeah. more work on that. I, I completely, I agree with all of that actually. So I, as far as I can tell, I was one of very few academics who supported the Trump's executive order. There were, I mean, there were times where the, there was very Trumpian language, which I could have done without in the executive order. But in terms of the actions it actually instituted, uh, like you, I, I think that it was correct, actually. It was the right thing, right and necessary thing to do. Um, uh, but, okay, so... Yeah, because the education, like, how do you apply that to the education for educational system, for example, where you have teachers yeah. um, not just teaching about white privilege, but also teaching about 55 genders and uh, anal sex and, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> right. Right. And how do you do that so, again without infringing on, I mean, teachers should have the freedom uh, to teach what they want in a sense. Right. I mean, um, so how do you do that without being overly bureaucratic and draconian? Right. 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 I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not sure anybody has a good answer, but, but as having government offices and government practices, Contractors taking government m money for essentially ideological indoctrination that is in effect racist. Like, yeah, that should be stopped. I mean, uh, you know, that's why I, I, the the order was justified. So, but you're on the point that this doesn't mean all diversity trainings are necessarily bad because you can do a diversity training without, uh, uh, you know, without uh, um, lambasting whiteness. Right, you can do that. It's like really not even that hard to do that. It's, there are organizations that right. will do that. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you saw Chloe Valerie on, on uh, you know, she she is, uh, has a, this whole anti-racism thing, but it's just like based on the individual and treating people with dignity and respect. And there's it's more than that. I have to have done the training, and it's like completely reasonable. It's completely not racist. It acknowledges that prejudice and discrimination kind of is out there, and maybe it's a problem, and maybe like we should do something about it. Um, so it's completely possible. It's completely possible to do it without the sort of essentially inciting race hatred. I mean, it, that is possible to do. So, so, in, but at the same time, I actually do think that many of the, many reasonable people People I consider reasonable, thoughtful, not particularly tribal. You know, they may end up on one side or another more than others, but they have histories of criticizing their own side, have um, raised concerns, which I think are justified, that the executive order will do two bad things. One is because it's Trump, it will convince other people that this is the right way, that wokeness and critical theory and, and, and what you and I might call it ideological indoctrination is none of those things. It's a high moral purpose and we need more of it because Trump has advocated it. Oh, I see. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, he's going to produce this, you know, he's such a polarizing and divisive and harsh figure. That'd be quite ironic that, if... Something against divisive concepts would be divisive. <laughs> right, right, yeah, well, so, but, I, but I, I, that's, I, and I think that's a reasonable thing. And then the other one was that universities will overreact. I mean, exactly as you were saying, you know, there is some gray area where it actually is an infringement on free speech and that freedom. And in order to avoid federal penalties that universities will you know basically create a firewall and bag you know stop trainings that don't violate the executive order because if you don't do any training at all then you're not violating the order so 
in doing my so so the third so we have this chapter so, so this article on uh my political bias, the second one on suppression, and we're for a edited book, we're working one on academic censorship. And in doing the one this is actually relevant. In doing the one on academic censorship, and by academic censorship, I don't really mean censorship of academics by outsiders. We mean academic censoring other academics. You know, things like editors forcibly retracting a paper that doesn't have, you know, any like serious violation, there's no fraud or right. gross error or anything like that. Um, so that we would count that as in a case of censorship, actually. Um, in, in working on that paper, I did some reading about the McCarthy era blacklists in academia. And I learned something that I didn't realize before working on this paper and going into that history. The government never fired or imprisoned any faculty who identified as a communist or took the Fifth Amendment, or that was one of the ways out to not rat on your friends was to take the Fifth Amendment. It was always the university. They would be they would be dragged before Congress. They would be grilled about, you know, were you ever a communist and did you ever know any communists? And, you know, maybe that was probably... The history there was kind of... I mean, we were in this intense conflict with the Soviet Union. There really were communists infiltrating fairly high levels of the government, that Congress would have hearings on this is not inherently wrong, although I think the way they did it ended up being a terrible injustice, actually. But, okay. So, but it was the university that after these people testified, fired these faculty. It was not the government. Mm. And so, when people now raise the red flag about universities overreacting to Trump's executive order in ways that actually, I mean, at this point, it's just a prediction, will infringe on academic freedom and freedom of speech. That's not a ridiculous fear. That, that is a fear well grounded in the behavior of academic administrators going back decades. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Uh, but again, something needs to be done. Um, and so, I mean, maybe just going back to classical liberalism and even enlightenment values, right? So this sometimes, um, like, I love um, just trying to go as foundation, right? You start from foundational principles that yeah. you can't disagree with, and then you, you, you go from there, right? And so to me, a university, if we want to try to improve things without getting political, right, we could just try and i think that's that's in large part what heterodox academy is is based on right let's just go back to classical liberal values enlightenment values of individual liberty reason science evidence due process and and then the, you know that's that's where we start and that's what we teach and everything has to be kind of evaluated in 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 reference to these foundational principles that are are debatable but 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 really, if we can't agree on those, then then we should be exclusive. And this is again why inclusivity to me is such a a red herring or just a useless uh, idea. Well, it's just code word, really, because like we can be inclusive to anyone that values individual reason and individual meritocracy. But but if you're against in reason and objectivity, then yeah, th there's no chance that will become violent and emotional. Right, because well, um, I mean, it's way worse than that. I mean, that's true, but it's way. I mean, individualism, individualism, and meritocracy in critical theory are condemned as white supremacy. Right. Well, I think I even saw something that objectivity was racist. Right. Um, right. Objectivity is racist. Yeah. Okay. There's no such thing as objectivity. So really, all you have are claims of objectivity, and it's really just white men trying to preserve their privilege that are making those claims. Right. But again, how do we get rid of that? Without, <laughs> like, again, I think, um, yeah. So, any other concrete uh, actions or, or good news <laughs> that you have? <laughs> yeah, so, right, because so, this is Saving uh, Science show, but it could also be called Saving Society. Uh, yeah, right. Like, because again, academia and science are the bedrock of civilized, or, yeah. sh or should be 
are the bedrock of civilized advanced societies and uh things like the more i dig deeper the the more i realize it's 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 more broken and and it's broken in foundational ways that like it's like a foundation it's like, it's like these big cracks in your house's foundation uh that they're so severe that it's possible we can't fix the system right and it's like the octopus again in academia we have problems with researchers and undisclosed conflicts of interest, problems with journals, problems with universities, problems with funding agencies, problems with journalists, for-profit publishers, right? And the entire system is broken at all levels in serious and foundational ways. And only a crazy person like me would, would have uh, <laughs> the idea that, oh, we can just tackle one each by each and uh, we'll fix every part of the system and uh, everything will be fine. <laughs> So right, so you, yes, I agree with all that. And and like, but what would it mean to really tear everything down? Like nobody's really going to do that either. So like, well, no, there are people like, considering it. So actually, when I was in Indonesia for four months, I was at Igdor, which uh, has as its mission to kind of create a new academia, which is based on foundational principles. And uh, I didn't really agree with you know all of uh, her ideas um but uh, and then i think uh i saw this kind of panel discussion by claire layman from the quillette uh and they had the discussion basically what we're also uh questioning is is it really yeah, is, is, is academic who's on my panel i didn't see that oh it was her and uh and then Lindsay shepherd which is a yeah a, a whistleblower yeah, yeah. yeah and then another woman and and actually, that was a funny part is that oh. there was a joke saying there was not enough diversity, not enough uh, male, <laughs> not enough gender diversity because it was just three women. But uh, anyways, oh, that's, right. that, that's what they're debating. Like, is, is academia so broken? The university system just needs to be rebuilt uh, from the ground up. And um, is that on YouTube? I think I yeah, want to see that. Yeah, I can send it to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I got and it. and I th I kind of agree with them, but. To me, as a desperate optimist, I think we should try a, that's just a few more years uh, because like, it's going to take so long and like to compete with the university and their branding and their marketing. Uh, like, you know, if you're just a no name university, like how are you going to attract actual uh, professors who are going to have to take a pay cut or work for free? I mean, it's right. So she has to find or, they, you know, you have to find a lot of capital um and and somehow attract but you know it's possible um and and that if you have these foundational my pitch would be come work at our known university but look there are like there are no rules there's like enlightenment values and basically no tenure review no committees no diversity yeah. <laughs> training uh <laughs> and very little teaching right so you would you would get a smaller salary, but you would actually get academic and administrative freedom yeah. to do yeah. your best work and tackle the most important uh, topics in your area. And so it would just be like back to basics, kind of traditional yeah. university. And uh, so they're thinking about it and, and maybe it's the only way out of it. But um, I, I figure like kind of like Peter Ridd is, is doing, trying to go political route because at the end of the day the taxpayer is paying for all of this and so Absolutely. the more the taxpayer knows about all these shenanigans the more you can use that as leverage to bring to the politician yeah. and say you know we need to raise the standards or else the funding should be cut and of course i'm not anti uh funding science but if if you're going to be funding bad science bad science Absolutely. is worse than useless so i tell people Bad right. science is worse than useless because it misleads the public. It misleads doctors yeah. uh, because right. people, as you say, you're a professor of Harvard, at Harvard, they listen to you a lot more than if you're just a crystal ball healer that runs a blog, right? <laughs> and and so with great power, great comes great responsibility. And yeah, to yeah. me, it's 2020. Uh, if you're still not disclosing your conflicts of interest and sharing your data, then to me, you should not be getting any public uh, funding right and yeah. so so yeah i mean any other positive uh 
any other developments that would give us hope uh, that yeah well, yeah so so there, there are now a fair number of people who have survived denunciations and attacks designed to get them fired or sanctioned in some way and I, I think surviving those sort of attacks I don't think it hardens you in an evil way. I think it strengthens, you know, it strengthens that core of people. And I don't, I think to some extent they're finding each other. And so now, whatever, five, six years ago when it first launched, I was hoping Heterodox Academy would be that thing. And it never did. I mean, I, I agree with your take very early, which you sort of, almost said under your breath, that they're kind of soft, right? They, they really never, I mean, Quillette does a better job taking on the Academy than does Heterodox Academy. Um, right. So, and do you so, know, like, so you were part of it, but I guess, I guess you don't have much power in there. Um, because as a concrete example, they used to have a ranking, uh, a university ranking where they would list the infractions of speech right. codes or other safe spaces, these things, right? And then it just disappeared and all of a sudden they just have some vague reason. I was like, that was the most useful part of your website is like, <laughs> I could go there and, you know, see who the, and see the all the misbehavior. Yeah. Right? Um, I think they had some doubt about the validity of the ranking. I think that's yeah. what, it, what it Which was. I agree with. And, you know, we, we do need high standards and, and we, we, we know about psychometrics, but you just put disclaimers that, you know, these are... Right. Just the way yeah. we're coding it, you can disagree. Again, the data is the data. You can disagree about the interpretation. No. Yeah. Um, and uh, but still, they've they've opened up kind of the yeah. the, the the discussion uh, room. So, so this is you know, I, I've come to think of this question as at least from an individual standpoint. Right? And to some extent, your question is, how do we change the entire system? And it's like, okay, that's like a hard thing to do. But, but from an individual standpoint, you, you can, given that the system is what it is, and like any person by themselves is not likely to change it, the question is, how can one be an effective dissenter? And that's a much, that's a very, that's, it's a subset of changing the whole thing, because the whole point of dissent is to change the system. But it's a more, you know, a, a more digestible task than changing the system. And they actually do have, like, answers. Like, I don't know, they, they won't work for everybody, but there are some answers. So, um, my, in the, in, so, so one, strategically, you do need to be careful, right? You want to stay out of the gun sight of the denouncers and the mob, right? The first thing is to survive. Because if, if you're not around, you can't engage in the fight. If, you know, if you get fired and you end up, you know, coding for Google, you're no longer maybe to do something in Google. We aren't doing anything in academia anymore. So you have to survive. So it's, it's completely reasonable when you are under assault, when there's a wave of these sort of denunciations and firings and outrage, to just back off. Just don't give them a target. Like this is this is Sun Tzu, right? This is basic. How you know when you're massively outnumbered, you do not attack the enemy, <laughs> right? So that's yeah. part of it. Along those lines, I'm actually teaching a graduate class. So the, so one thing we can do is share with people what we our understanding of how these things work. So in the wake of my own denunciation and the Floyd protests and the rise of this actual left-wing extremism, you know, and the, the close election and Trump, it's like, what the heck? This is just this, everything is toxic. We're just surrounded by toxicity. So like, what the hell? So what do, what do um, academics do? Well, they talk. So, so at the end of August, I, so I, as chair, I have no, I don't have to teach. Like I'm, I, I'm relieved of all teaching duties for good reason. The administrative stuff is so, is ridiculous. Yeah. So this is not like a boon. It's more like a support necessary to do the job. 
But, okay, so I started having conversations with several grad students who were consistent with your and my conversation. Like, regardless of their politics, they wanted to talk to people, there's this whole denunciation thing was driving them crazy, like, you know, there were things on the, on the other side that they might not only not like, but really, really not like, really be morally outraged by, but that the solution wasn't to, like, you know, demonize people, it was that, so, okay. So, I had these discussions, and it was, this was a good group. It wasn't even a group yet, that they were good discussions. And people wanted to continue it. So it's like, okay, maybe we should do this as a regular meeting group. And then it occurred to me, that these were all graduate students at the time. I mean, if we're going to meet regularly to discuss, I'll just do it as a graduate class. And, yeah. you know, I have some, like, requirement, you know, because I have to actually give a grade, but I would purposely make it kind of a light requirement. Um, so at the end of August, I created a graduate class that... Is basically an underground class. I'll explain that in a minute. That really is the psychology of counter revolution. <laughs> it's called the psychology of conflict, social movements, and radicalization. And it is on that, actually. Um, but like the first couple of things that we read were excerpts from the Gulag Archipelago <laughs> and from the Chinese, from the Cultural Revolution, the sort of history of, of China under Mao. Um, and they're horrible. They were completely horrible. All done in the name of social justice and equality, um, with the high, you know, the highest of morals, and they were just horrendous. So, so anyway, it's a semi-underground class, because in August, you know, the semester started in September. In August, as it was finally actually coalescing, I, we had a preliminary meeting where I asked them, well, how, you know, should I announce this to the rest of the department? And if so, how? And I thought most of the discussion was going to be on how, like when to do it and, you know, what should I say about it? But no, I never got to that point because they did not want me to announce it to the department. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were afraid that the class was going to be canceled in both senses, that it would first be denounced and then actually literally canceled. Yeah, but that's kind of a good test, right? I was going to go in first and say, well, you should live broadcast it. <laughs> <laughs> because, though, like, we need to join forces. This, and yeah, this yeah. is like what, like, it's very isolated. It's already an isolating time. But when you're a dissident, you're even more isolated. And it's very lonely at the bottom. And, uh, but, the, but I was joking uh, with, I think, Peter Ridd that, but a, a lot of times, dissidents and free thinkers are not the type of people that are good at forming groups, right? right. I mean, it's like Groucho right. Marx, I guess, right? I mean, <laughs> right, 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 right. but we do need to join forces because we're really fighting a big uh, yeah. battle. And um, so we kind of do need to join forces and coordinate. Uh, so, but you know, I guess continue with the. <laughs> so, what happened? Yeah, I, you know, I think as much as anything, at least one of the other, one of the students, in the class has talked about having been denounced within by other graduate students at least twice. Um, I don't think the others have. We have drawn in uh, a person who I met through Twitter, April Harding, is an economist who used to work at the World Bank. So she's like, like this serious person. She's not just like, you know, some rando on Twitter who is like kind of articulate. Um, and she's been coming to every one of the meetings. So she, she's great, actually. And then coming half the time about is Ann Wilson. She's a social psychologist at Wilfrid Laurier, speaking of Lindsay yeah. Shepard, um, who has done work on partisanship and polarization. Um, and she's been great, actually. So, so, and they just come because they come out of the goodness of, you know, like, I mean, I'm not getting any, anything tangible out of teaching this class, and they're not getting anything at all other than the pleasure of the, dis- the value of the discussion. Um, and, and both, you know, they're all good. If I, I they all push, I, if I say something they don't agree with, they, they will say something. They will be uninhibited in saying so, but respectful. You can, they're not mutually exclusive. It's like, no, I think that's really wrong and here's why. And it's like, you know, huh. and it, it's great. It's been great. Well, that's good to hear. And, um, and is it ongoing? Oh, yeah. I mean, through the semester. Right. So the idea of live streaming it, 
I'm going to have to chew on that. I'm going to bring this up to them. Like, I'm not going to do it without their okay. And, right, and right. They are, I mean, I, speaking for myself, I am finding the discussions just terrific. They really are terrific. So one, yeah. one of the weeks, you know, first we did the, some of the historical stuff. One of the weeks is this great reading on the, it's, a, it's an essay on, it's not titled this, but it's essentially a hundred years of the liberal left battling the illiberal left, going back right. to the 1920s. And that was another eye-opener for me, because it's like, this is a resurgence, a recurrence of stuff that has been going on and off for a very long time. Now, it was mostly off most of my adult life. You know, there were some in the 60s and 70s, but I was too young to really know about that. And this, you know, this surgency of the illiberal left, there wasn't any in like the 80s and 90s. And it was the 2000s when it kind of began. At first, I wasn't really paying attention. And about 10 years ago, it really began to pick up. But, but this is like, it's a cycle. It's a cycle that has repeated itself for at least 100 years. Right. And I think it's Jordan Peterson that talks about how tribalism inherently, like, like democracy and, and, and civilized society is inherently fragile. And if with too many bumps, uh, we can quickly yeah. regress back towards Absolutely. emotional tribalism and so and so that's kind of one of the many silver linings of going through these dark times is yeah. that there are more people aware um so maybe just to finish with so we were saying about how to be better dissidents right which is positive so what would be other maybe examples and then we can wrap up about how to be a better dissident as an individual yeah well um I, that's a work in pro The answer to that question for me is a work in progress. Um, and I do think, you know, there, there are multiple avenues. For, as an academic, there's multiple avenues now, right? There's conventional peer-reviewed publications. There are blogs and social media. And now there are events like this. So the podcast has really come up. And so I, I think sort of Persuasion 101 is to, to get out your perspective and to do it as reasonably and when possible, as civilly as possible. That, but, but that doesn't mean backing off. That means, you mean, it means not backing off and standing firm, but being vocal. With, without, you know, so probably my first two years on Twitter, I made the mistake of seeing all these nutcase ideas among academics and then arguing with people. <laughs> and your know, arguments, it's just not good. There's, there's nothing good comes of that. Um, so I don't really do that anymore. Um, and I would say to be an effective dissident, you just don't do that. You just don't do it. It's, nothing good is going to happen. All you're going to do is inflame people's partisan tribal you know, uh, allegiances, and no one is going to actually hear the underlying ideas. It really serves no value whatsoever. But, you know, the media are different. You know, having a model, pa a paper that's a model of political bias has ratcheted up the sort of theoretical status of these criticisms that the field has of political bias. You know, it's one thing to just like, you know, some random faculty moaning and bitching about political bias. It's quite another to have a theory and, you know, a theoretical paper in a peer reviewed journal. We're, we're actually one of the grad students working with me, sort of more than a grad student. He's been really productive and has a gazillion publications and he's just really good. Are working on a series of empirical tests of political bias in academia. And it's very difficult, right? Because, you know, it, if you're talking about the, either what gets funded or what gets published, you know, you have to have grant applications or articles and then people have to read them, but they, they, they want to manipulate them and manipulate, like, is, is it a, le a left-leaning article or right? I mean, there's just very effort-intensive on the part of people who you're, you know, your respondents, right? It's like to require or to rig an experiment where because we are 
you know, basically lying to academics that the paper that they're reading is a real paper, and it's just some bogus thing being invented, and then to spend three or four hours doing the review, even I don't have the heart to inflict that mm-hmm. on my colleagues, even when they irritate me. Right. Well, I mean, that's a big imposition. So probably what we're going to do, we just started working on this also, is extract snippets of the entire research process and politicize them, and then ask academics to evaluate their quality, credibility, persuasiveness, value, informativeness, you know, all that, all that good kind of stuff. So the, the first, what we're talking about right now, for example, is that over the last four or five years, there's been this slow rise in credible research on left-wing authoritarianism, like for 50 years, the claim was that there was no such thing. Right. But, you know, but people have figured out how to assess it, actually. And there are several different roughly authoritarianism scales now. So a very simple version of this political bias type assessment would be to give faculty a left-wing authoritarianism question and a right-wing authoritarianism question that are nearly identical. So, you know, we need to crush... The radicals, the radicals trying to impose traditional ideas on society, we need to crush the radicals trying to impose new ideas on society. Then it was something like that. Right. And just, I just ask our colleagues, how good is this question in a between subject design so they don't know we're asking about the other question? My prediction is, you know, if the field, and this would be exactly the kind of interpretive bias that you and I started this conversation with. Yeah. The natural prediction is that they're going to have lots of reasons to believe that this question assessing left-wing authoritarianism is a weak question. It's you know not really a good question. It doesn't do a very good job. It wouldn't really that, be that interesting if somebody did it anyway, and it certainly wouldn't be valid, which they're not going to claim about the right-wing authoritarianism question. Huh. Though, that is otherwise really identical. Right. Though I guess the challenge will be that there still will be heterogeneity uh, in people's ideological biases, right? Uh, because, yeah. like, across uh, an individuals, uh, like, you could have kind of different manifestations of your left leaning biases, as you kind of described in the pyramid, right? There's different yeah. levels of wokeness that contaminate people to different extents. And that, when you average across that, it'll be maybe hard to detect, or like, but you're probably expecting small differences. But uh, no, that's very interesting. And actually, it, it really becomes more about meta science. So I know you like you're a social yeah. like, but that's why like you are basically doing meta science, like you're examining ideological political biases, uh, but as a meta scientist, right? Uh, so that's right. absolutely, yeah, that's right. yeah, that's totally the idea. And what about going back to uh, how to be better at these civilized discussions, like the uh, like the Socra- Socratic method? So that's something I've seen, um, and there's a lot of different opinions on it. But where, because one problem is, you, you know, if you're trying to use reason and arguments and evidence uh, against someone who uh, it gets very emotional, right? Uh, like it breaks down very quickly. And so I've kind of started thinking that the Socratic method, and there's a there's people who like change my mind, uh, where like you, you're you're literally asking questions and when someone you ask them to state their position and then you just question assumptions underlying their position right and so it be, it kind of prevents it from or or at least it escalates like you're kind of like it's less confrontational i guess like any thoughts on maybe the promise of, of that um i i, I would actually be very on an individual basis, you know, on a dyadic person, in the conversation one on one, I think that probably would work most of the time. That, that, you know, you can sort of, it ratchets everything down so that people's emotions get kind of walked back a little bit. But as soon as it becomes social, it becomes tribal. And, and, uh, you know, people are going to engage in moral grandstanding and virtue signaling and, you know, just all this stuff that uh, as a, I mean, you, the, the prediction would seem to be that 
because that's what the academy stood for for so long, or at least so we thought, that should be the norm now. But it's the exact opposite. So it's, to me, that's like a gigantic failure. The academy failed to, in, in, you know, to in, in, um, uh, not instigate, to instill that value in the society. It failed. Yeah. So that makes me pessimistic. It's like a tool. It's like a small screwdriver that you keep for very selective purposes, <laughs> but it's not going to fix the building. Right. But still, I think if we record the Socratic method or, or like you record debates and actually part of our show, uh, we do want to eventually, I, again, it's technically more difficult, but eventually we want to try to host debates where we have a moderator and two debaters who are debating uh, a resolution. And, and so not only is that effective, but then you're kind of showcasing to others, right? Okay, this is what you can do with your friends when you're debating with uh, friends and family. Right. Uh, because others, I've noticed others have inspired me. Uh, and there's different, like the Socratic method, there's different kinds of it. But, but uh, basically just trying to get away from uh, these kind of more confrontational attacks that, oh, yeah. I, you know, I'm right, self-righteous, and then you're wrong, and then you're like so evil because you believe this, right? So you, you're just asking questions, indirect questions. It's almost like psychotherapy, maybe. Like you're, you're asking questions and you're letting the person kind of figure out problems with their arguments right so then they become right. aware like i have no right. you uh, familiar with uh, change my mind uh, and again this is a great example so this is steven crowder who's a pretty uh right well i wouldn't say pretty right but he's he's right uh of center uh even potentially christian and he's pro-gun i mean i dis like there's more things i disagree with him on than i agree with him on but I have been inspired by some of his formats, which include Change My Mind. He sets up a booth on the street that says, you know, I don't believe in systemic racism. Prove me wrong. Right. And has people sit down and they consent to being recorded. Right. And then they, you know, they get millions of views of people watching actually a civilized debate. Right. Uh, though they need security guards, I guess. But uh, uh <laughs> So, you know, that, that gives me hope. Um, and, it, and, and so they're really showing that, no, you can have civilized discussion. It can get heated. It can yeah. get uncomfortable. And uh, some of them don't work, right? Uh, they, they probably cherry pick the ones that did went uh, uh, better than right. others. But, but still, um, I think there is hope no matter how dark it is. There is, there is hope. That all, the well, there is hope. I mean, I'm definitely going to agree with that. <laughs> but, but I think it mostly doesn't get to that point because so uh, certainly in academia, but even in general, people live in ideological tribal bubbles. So there's no one to, it's like everyone around you thinks a certain, you know, in, in, in academia, like everyone thinks Trump is a fascist. <laughs> so no, I mean, he's a bad guy, he's a, there's all these things, but he's not a fascist. I mean, there's just, like, there's nothing, you know, I, I would prefer that he was more ready to concede the election. I think that is a problem. I think he is kind of a conspiracy theorist. I think he is out of touch with reality often. But fascism is a, I mean, if the word fascism has any meaning, he's not a fascist. But if, you know, if you said Trump was a fascist in any academic circle, you're going to get almost no pushback and lots of enthusiasm. No. So it doesn't come up. It just doesn't come up. There's this like civil, there's no one to have a civil discussion with. And it's not just academia. I mean, if you look at the American electoral map, uh, you know, in the heartland of the country, those states are going 70%, 80% in some cases for Trump. It's like everyone around you, now, you know, and especially in the cities, most, most cities, even cities in the Midwest and South, lean left or democratic. But once you get out of the big cities, it's like 80, 90% Trump. That, that's even true in New Jersey. Right. So, and my point is not that that's good or bad, that's just describing the way it is, but that means, for most of us, the people we're around are just like us. Yeah. We don't, it doesn't come up to have a civil discussion. Yeah, and the social media makes it worse again because you, you can block people without having to confront them, right? Whereas in real right. life, 
like even if you say, oh, I don't want to talk to you, you have to walk away and the person can yell at you right. for like 10, 20 seconds. And then you might <laughs> th get home and realize, oh, they're nasty people, but they had a point, right? And again, right. the free marketplace right. and the collision of ideas, uh, J.S. Mill, like yeah. it, it can be nasty. And, and we it basically freedom of expression does mean we have to deal with some very, very distasteful people and distasteful ideas, but it's still better than uh censorship yeah, right and yeah. um oh there was a, another thing i lost my uh train of thought but um yeah well this is great um we should wrap up is there any other do you have any plugs or any uh books or any other thing you yeah. want to promote <laughs> Not, not at this point. I, I do have a book that's at the publisher, but God knows when it'll actually come out. Okay. So. And that's actually on the science reform stuff. So, yeah. It's not no political stuff in it. Just straight up methods, practices, statistics. Oh, I remember that. I thought, yeah. I was talking about debates. So, have, are there student clubs at Rutgers? Um, I mean, now there's COVID challenges, but um, how is that culture where um, student clubs organize you know, debates? Um, so maybe that's something you could tr try to work on, um, where, you know, you try to organize debates and then again, live stream them for maximum impact where like you, you want, like, and that's, we'll show you how much academic freedom, uh, yeah. exists yeah. where you invite a controversial or well, controversial speaker that does, that's almost anyone these days. Uh, <laughs> and then again, it's not just interesting, but it shows a role model assuming that it can take place like have is that a thing at Rutgers uh inviting speakers and having debates uh I'm gonna say no like I, I certainly don't know of anything like that um so there is no ongoing thing like that that I know about that doesn't mean I mean Rutgers is really big so it could be in some obscure little corner there is some student club that does it But I don't know about it. But I think you should try. And it, it, it <laughs> and no, because this would be interesting. Like you should make a debate yeah. on, you know, freedom of speech. And then if the debate itself is canceled, then you basically, <laughs> like it's telling in itself, right? I thought even having yeah, a debate, no, the debate should be, be it resolved that there's a freedom <laughs> of expression problem on campus. And that debate probably will try to get canceled, right? Uh, well, so, so, so I, I don't have any direct experience with that, but um, my, this mate, the grad student working with me on the political bias studies, was a grad rep, like to the Graduate Student Association, I don't know, like three or four years ago. Um, and he brought first informally to the Graduate Student Association um, a resolution to adopt the Chicago Statement on Free Speech. Yeah. And he ran it blank wall. They just didn't want to hear it. And, it. and it went nowhere. Now, I then did use that in an undergraduate social class I was teaching, where we tried to present both sides of that, you know, in a fairly neutral, kind of disinterested manner. And the format I used was, you know, so there were these two resolutions to adopt it and his wife, to not adopt it and his wife. And then they broke up into small groups and had to decide whether they were for it, against it, or for it with modification. Small groups of like three or four, or some cases two. And the idea was for the group to try to come to a consensus and then to vote as a group. And then I would hold the group. Right. It was an amazing experience. There you go. No, no group was against it. The class was split about 50-50 between those for it and those for it with modification. The modification, there were a couple of groups that proposed specific modifications, which were to put teeth into the Chicago State. Wow. That is to punish students who violated it. So it wasn't like walking back style modifications. It was strengthening style modifications. Probably justified. And the most, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it, it was a good point. It was a good point and a good discussion. And that sort of uplifted my spirit for like a year. It's like if you just put this before people, 
like young people who maybe haven't fully thought it through, they quickly come to the right conclusion. They, you know, what the only reasonable conclusion is that a university should be defending academic freedom and free speech. No. And they do, university. Wow. Well, I think that's a good spot to end. Uh, and actually, I want to try to do that at, so there's two universities here, University of Ottawa and Carleton University. And I wanted to actually try to, and my niece actually goes to University of Ottawa. And I want to try to set up that debate. And actually, Gad said uh, that I think you were on his show. Yeah, He's yeah, in yeah. Montreal, Concordia University. And I, I, I want to try to uh, coordinate with him uh, to try to get a debate at Concordia University. Uh, which you know he's surviving there, but it seems like it's it's also pretty uh, suffocating. Um, yeah. So okay, well this is great. Um, thanks for doing this again, and uh, we should do it again uh, and I, and talk more. Okay. And because yeah, there's a, there's a lot of craziness, but as we demonstrated, hopefully there's some glimmer of hope and, and light at the end of the tunnel. And so let's just <laughs> be better dissidents and keep on trucking. <laughs> Thank you. This was great. It's important that you, the taxpayer, engage with the videos to increase their visibility. So please like or dislike videos, leave a comment regarding points of clarification or other issues or topics you'd like us to cover. Leave comments pointing out any inaccuracies, mischaracterizations, errors. Finally, please consider making a donation so we can continue to create videos and achieve our goals of reforming research standards in academia. You can make a donation on our Patreon page, link to my left, or by making a one-time PayPal donation, link in the video description. Thank you.